Uh, my name is Carla Luton. I am Associate Director of Adult Faith Formation here at St. Martha's and I am going to be with you about, I'll be with you every week, but I'll be able to um, share with you um, reflections on the Gospel of Mark about once a month. And I am very excited about this Gospel. We had the opportunity during the summer to travel to St. Louis and, and kind of get uh, an overview of the Gospel. And I think that that really energized those of us that were able to go and I've spent the weekend kind of immersed in Mark, so I am right now very excited about that. So I hope I can share some of that with you. Um, what I have the task of doing today is giving you an overview um, of the, the entire book. Um, it's kind of a big task, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about who the author is and what the climate of the times were and why it was written and what the theology behind it and the Christology is um, in this very very, very special gospel. Um, when we begin the new uh, the new liturgical year, which begins at the beginning of Advent, we will be starting into year B in the liturgical year, and the uh, Gospel of Mark will be read um, throughout this year. So it's going to be a special time for us to be studying this gospel. Um, during the summer, I was going through an old stack of newspapers that I had kind of collected over the year and didn't have time to look at and I came across this. This was out of the parade magazine you know that comes in the Sunday papers and what it was is it was a collection of kind of facts, trivia facts um, about who we are in the 21st century living in America and it was called America by the Numbers and I tore this sheet out during the summer and somehow I retained it and found it this week which was that alone is a miracle. Um, but I I thought it was very interesting because it has these little snapshots of who we are in America in the 21st century. For example, it says that the best city for online dating in the United States is Boston. So if, if you're into online dating, that's where you need to go. This surprised me, the most vegetarian friendly city in the United States. Where do you think that might be? I would have thought LA is a good, I would have thought California, that would have been my first guess. Washington, D.C. I, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, Chicago, no surprise here, voted the best sports city. I think of sports when I think of Chicago, that doesn't surprise me. The best bike culture in the United States, bicycle. I would have thought maybe Austin, because I know that they've got kind of a lot of that, um, but it's Portland, Oregon, so it's up in the Northwest. What is Austin, Texas known for? What is its call to fame? They are the home of the biggest spenders. <laughs> I thought that was <laughs> very interesting. So if you're going to own a store, move to Austin. Um, and then Miami Beach has the distinction of being the most tattooed city in the United States. So I kind of thought that that was interesting and I thought I would share that with you because a lot of people look at the Gospel of Mark as sort of a, a snapshot of the life of Jesus. It is the shortest gospel and it is contained, almost all of the verses from Mark are contained somewhere in the gospels of Matthew or the gospel of, of Luke. We call those three gospels the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they all are similar in telling the story of the life of Jesus. And Mark being the shortest one and most likely the first one to be written, there are 661 verses in Mark and out of those 661 verses 636 of them also appear in Matthew or Luke. Um, in fact, for a long time, scholars in the church kind of dismissed this gospel because it was short and because the verses were contained somewhere else. So in the liturgical calendar of the Tridentine or the pre-Vatican II Mass, Mark was only read three times 
So that was, the, that was all we ever heard of Mark before that because they would defer to Matthew or to Luke. Um, and they didn't really see the significance of this gospel. Thank goodness now in the uh, post-Vatican II we have uh, the year B that's dedicated to the gospel of Mark. So we get to spend some time in Mark. Um, with the advent of biblical scholarship that took place um, a little over 100 years ago, it was at the, the turn of the last century, that thinking changed because scholars began to study this gospel and they began to see that Mark had very strong theological and Christological significance um, and that taking into account the Church of Rome to which it was written, um, it, it was intended to remind the followers of Jesus that he also had suffered and this gospel was meant to give them hope. Mark wrote to show not only who Jesus was, we're going to talk a little bit about how important that is in Mark, that revelation as we go along of who Jesus is. But he also wrote about the humanity of Jesus as well. Mark's gospel is a call to discipleship. So it's not only about who Jesus is, but about who we are in light of who Jesus is, who we, we are called to be as disciples of Christ. And it is a call to accept not only the resurrection of Christ, but the cross as well. So it does focus some on the humanity of Jesus and on the cross. First, before we go back and look at this theology and, and Christological significance, let's look at the snapshot of Mark itself. First of all, let's look at the author. Who is Mark? Um, we've met him before. Those of you who were here last year and read the letter uh, from Peter. Uh, Mark was a disciple of Peter and worked very closely with him. In fact, when you think of Peter as a Galilean fisherman and you think in terms of him being able to, to put down his writings, he didn't have a lot of knowledge of Greek. Mark was one of the people who did. So Mark was a scribe for Peter. And in fact, at the end of the letter of 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5.13 says this, when Peter calls him Mark, my son, he doesn't mean mean that in the biological sense. He's not his biological son, but he's his son in the faith. Mark has been a disciple of Peter all along. Um, he's also a co-worker with Peter at the church in Rome. Mark, or John Mark, as he is really called, um, many of them had two names at that time, the first name being sort of a more ethnic name, like a Hebrew name, the name of John, and then Mark being his Greco-Roman name. So he would have been known as John Mark, or more likely in the Church of Rome uh, as just Mark, as we know him. He was probably just a young boy when all of the events that we read about in the Gospel took place. We meet him in the book of Acts. We meet him, first of all, in chapter 12 of the book of Acts. Um, when Peter, after he escapes from jail, you know, when, prison, when Peter was in prison and he was released from jail by the angel, and the angel took him and, and led him, um, where the angel led him to was to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who is called Mark. And there were people gathered in prayer at that house. Um, so he was the son of a very prominent Christian family in Jerusalem, so raised in a Christian home in Jerusalem. In fact, there are many people that believe that it was his parents' home where the disciples went for the Last Supper, what we know of as the upper room, where they were taken and they prepared the Last Supper, and also where they might have been gathered for the Feast of Pentecost cost where the Holy Spirit came upon them. It's very likely that that home was the home of John Mark, where he was probably a young man at that time. Um, we do know that he was the cousin of Barnabas, and he went with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, and we find that also in the book of Acts, in Acts 12:25. Um, in the middle of that first missionary journey, John Mark left them and returned to his home in Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem. After that, they underwent some persecution, Paul and Barnabas. Um, so when it came time for them to go back for the second missionary journey and to return to the cities that they had already visited, um, Barnabas said, why don't we take my cousin John Mark along with us again? He went with us the first time. Well, Paul reminded him that he had deserted them at Pamphylia and uh, he said, I don't think so. Let's not take John Mark with us. Um, and there, it says in Acts 15, 39, so sharp was their disagreement that the two of them actually separated over it. So Barnabas took Mark and he sailed in one direction to Cyprus and Paul took Silas and he departed in the, in the other direction. Um, Mark eventually became the scribe of Peter and it's because of this relationship to Peter that he was asked to write this gospel. Um, we know that uh, from a lot of different ways. There are a lot of hints within the gospel itself. And there's a, a sheet of paper back in the back that y'all are going to have circulated that has, do y'all already have that, the one that has? Okay, at the very top of it, it talks a little bit about how we know that he was writing um, from Rome. It's in the tradition that he was writing in Rome. We find in the early church writers like Clement of Alexandria, uh, Irenaeus, Tertullian, a lot of them mention Mark being in Rome and writing this gospel for the people of Rome. We also find that he uses very many Latin words, which he normally wouldn't have done unless he was writing for um, a Roman audience. And he also, um, because the church in Rome was a mixture of Jewish and Gentile Christians, he often will explain to them um, a Hebrew tradition that a Jewish church would have known. Um, but he translates Hebrew words and explains customs for them. And it's got that on that sheet of paper. It tells a little bit about where you're going to find that. Um, it also talks about um, Rufus. It says that Simon of Cyrene was the father of Alexander and Rufus, prominent among the Christians of Rome. You find that in the Gospel of Mark, and Rufus is also mentioned in the letter of Paul to the Romans when he is talking um, about the people that he knows in Rome to, to greet them, to greet Rufus. So all of these things together seem to say that he was definitely writing to that church in Rome. Um, we have further verification of this relationship between Mark and Peter in the writings of the early church historian Eusebius who wrote in the third century. He wrote this, so brightly shone the light of true religion on the minds of Peter's hearers that not satisfied with a single hearing or with the oral teaching of the divine message, they resorted to appeals of every kind to induce Mark, whose gospel we have, as he was a follower of Peter, to leave them in writing a summary of the instruction they had received by word of mouth. Nor did they let him go till they had persuaded him, and thus became responsible for the writing of what is known of the gospel according to Mark. So that's very clear. Um, and also, um, Eusebius quoted Bishop Papias of Heropolis, who wrote in the first century, and he said, Mark, who had been Peter's interpreter, wrote down carefully, but not in order, all that he remembered of the Lord's sayings and doings. For he had not heard the Lord or been one of his followers, but later, as I said, he was one of Peter's. Peter used to adapt his teaching to the occasion without making a systematic arrangement of the Lord's sayings. So Mark was quite justified in writing down some things just as he remembered them, for he had one purpose only, to leave out nothing that he had heard and to make no misstatement about it. So basically, Mark was not an eyewitness to most of these things. He was not one of the original disciples. Basically, he got his knowledge from being um, the scribe of Peter by, by sitting at Peter's feet and listening to Peter preach. And as it said, Peter didn't necessarily preach in order of how things happened. So Mark had um, a task ahead of him to write down the preaching of Peter. How was he going to do that? How was he going to put all 
all of this together. Think in terms of putting together um, a puzzle where you don't necessarily have the picture. You know how you always cheat and you look at the picture on the front of the puzzle when you get stumped? He didn't necessarily have that picture, so he had all of these little stories that he had to put together. Some things were obvious. The baptism comes at the beginning and the death and the re resurrection would come toward the end. But what about the rest? What about all of the stories of the preaching of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, and the things that happened in his life? So it's within studying Mark, and this is what happened a hundred years ago when those theologians started to look at this book. It's within studying it that we're able to see the work of the Holy Spirit and how this this gospel is truly a brilliant theological and Christological work put together in this way. Mark wrote in something that we call pericopes, and pericopes are stories that stand alone. And we're familiar with pericopes because when we go to Mass on Sunday and we hear a gospel reading, that's kind of what we hear. We hear a pericope of the gospel, a story that you can take and hear that story and it can stand alone, and we reflect on it in that way. So think in terms of Mark building a wall. So he takes these little building blocks called pericopes and he puts them together and he builds this wall into what's called the Gospel of Mark. When we look at the construction of Mark, there's something very interesting that we see in how these pericopes are put together. In order to tell that story the best way he could, Mark used a technique called a sandwich technique. So imagine a sandwich. You're going to make a sandwich for your child before they go to school. You take two pieces of bread. Those are the outside of the sandwich. You're going to put some sort of filling in the middle, whether it's chicken salad or, or turkey. It's usually the meat of the sandwich goes in the middle. So you've got the two pieces of bread. Um, they're similar on the outside, but not exactly the same. And inside is the meat, and that's the important part. So all through the story of Mark, you're going to see these sandwiches where he starts to tell a story, the first piece of bread, and then he interrupts that story and goes to something different, which is the meat of the sandwich, and then he comes back to the original story, and that's the other piece of bread. And when put together, then it focuses focuses our attention on what's in the middle. So it focuses our attention on the meat of it. And as an example of that, um, and again on this sheet of paper it talks about the, the sandwiches, it gives you some examples of that at the bottom so you can look some of those up. What we're going to look at today is the one from chapter 11 where he curses a fig tree. Okay, it says in chapter 11, verse 12, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing from a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went over to see if he could find anything on it. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves. It was not the time for figs. And he said to it in reply, no one will ever eat of your fruit again. And his disciples heard it. Then he walks away from the fig tree, kind of forgets about that. That's the first piece of bread. In the middle, the meat of the story is the cleansing of the temple. They came to Jerusalem, and on entering the temple area, he began to drive out those selling and buying there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. He did not permit anyone to carry anything through the temple area. Then he taught them, saying, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples, but you have made it a den of thieves. Well, then he walks away from that temple, the meat of the sandwich, the true story of what this is all about. And the next day we find him walking out of Jerusalem. Early in the morning as they were walking along, they saw the fig tree and it was withered to its roots. Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus said to them in reply, Have faith in God. Amen, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that what he says will happen. It shall be done for him. So it may seem like these stories are not connected in any way, but he was trying to point to them that this life that the scribes and the Pharisees were living was without fruit. It hadn't borne fruit. And if they continued in that path, then they were not going to have life. They were going to win 
wither and die. That wasn't where life was in that life of the temple that had been created in the time. So that's one example of how Mark is going to use um, sandwiches to teach us theology. He's going to do that all the way through. Mark's gospel is a very human gospel. Throughout these chapters, we will see the disciples bicker and squabble. We will see them completely miss the point on more than one occasion. We will also see the humanity of Jesus. We will see him get angry. We will see him get tired and hungry. And we will see him sigh deeply usually right after the disciples show how clueless they are. My favorite example is after he has done the multiplication of the loaves, not once, but twice. And they come to him and say, we're hungry, we don't have anything to eat. You can just hear him going, did you not get it? <laughs> but they don't get it because it is a very human gospel. And it's a human gospel on purpose. If Mark is a snapshot of the life of Jesus, then we can say that Matthew is kind of like glamour shots. It's all airbrushed and, and corrected. Everything taken away. But Mark is not. Mark shows the reality, warts and all, to truly appreciate this and understand why this gospel was written that way. We have to look at the climate of persecution that was taking place in the city of Rome at that time. Um, when St. Paul wrote his letter to the Romans, which had been about 10 years previous, we saw the church of Rome thriving, an influential church. And it was dealing with the issues of combining the faith of Jewish Christians with Gentile Christians. Um, the Jews in Rome had been banned from that city at about the year 49. When you're reading the book of Acts, you see this in the story of Priscilla and Aquila, who have been banished from, from Rome and they now have come um, to live somewhere else. Um, but eventually those Jewish people were welcomed back. But in that time they were gone, the Gentile church in Rome was thriving. It grew and was thriving. So now these Jewish Christians came back and you know they still had some of their traditions and they're trying to meld this church together between the Jewish and the Gentile Christians. And that was primarily what they were dealing with. It was a very influential church and both Peter and Paul spent time in Rome in that church. Well, all of that changed in 64 AD as fire swept through the city of Rome. Um, Two-thirds of the city was destroyed, including many of the slums that Nero had wanted to have leveled for his own building projects. He had, he had kind of looked at those slums before and, and said, if those were gone, I could do this, this, and this. But when the fire subsided and the city lay in ashes and ruins, Nero showed no concern for the citizens that had lost their homes. He did not have any plans to rebuild those homes or those parts of the city. Instead, he went on with his own plan and started to um, build those magnificent buildings that he had wanted. Well, many of the citizens of Rome scoffed at that and they were looking for someone to blame and they said, you know, maybe Nero started this fire on purpose. He didn't seem to do anything to put it out and he doesn't seem all that upset that all of this area of Rome um, burned. Um, I was telling Pam yesterday, if you ever get a chance to see the movie, a movie from about 30 minutes, maybe 40 years ago, Quo Vetus, that has a wonderful showing of this burning of Rome and what Nero decided to do. Um, so Nero started to look around and say, well, who can I blame for this fire? I don't want to be blamed for it. Who can I blame? So he decided, well, I'll blame it on the Jews because the Jewish sector of the city had not been destroyed. It was still intact. But his wife was a supporter of the Jews and she intervened and asked him not to blame them. So he then decided that he would put the blame on this new sect of believers, and that was the Christians. What followed was an unspeakable period of cruelty and persecution. 
this is what we, we think of when we think of the Colosseum and the Christians being fed to the lions and things like that. Christians were thrown to wild beasts in the Colosseum. They were even used as human torches to light the courtyards of Nero's palace. Unspeakable cruelty to the Christians. So it was to these persecuted Christians that this gospel was written. They had been a strong, influential church, and now they were being called to suffer and come to the cross. They had to be reminded of what Jesus had gone through. Mark is keenly aware that they are living between the times. Their faith is firmly anchored in the risen Lord, but they're living between the resurrection and the realization of the kingdom. In other words, life in the here and now is real and earnest, and it can be very grim. Mark sees the revelation of salvation takes place in the reality of human existence. And it was altogether fitting that God's plan for our salvation should be presented in terms of the humanity, the human life of Jesus Christ. Jesus won his victory through suffering and death. Mark's gospel is breathless. If you ever have a chance to sit down and read it in one sitting, you'll feel that breathlessness. When we study it one chapter at a time, we don't feel it that much. But sit down and read it. If you were to read it in the original Greek, it would seem to be a run-on sentence that just kept going, connected by the word and. And Jesus went to Jerusalem. And Jesus went to Caesarea Philippi. It just keeps going once it starts. Um, in English, you're going to find the word immediately written several times from the moment that Jesus walks out of the desert in the first chapter of John and he declares the coming of the kingdom to the time that the women stand before the empty tomb. We feel urgency. We feel that breathlessness. The symbol for Mark the evangelist is the lion. You know how each of the four evangelists have a symbol, and Mark's symbol is the lion. Some say it's because of the verse in the first chapter that talks about Jesus coming out of the desert, and the desert being the place of wild beasts, wild animals. But it also seems to us as we're reading it that the gospel roars along like a lion all the way through. So keep in mind as we're reading it that that symbol for the evangelist Mark is the lion. The Christology of Mark as he puts together these pericopes and builds this wall is centered on a pivotal part that occurs in Mark 8.27. I'm going to read that, and it's the part where Jesus asks Peter, Who do you say that I am? Now Jesus and his disciples set out for the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Along the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? They said in reply, John the Baptist, others, Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter said to him in reply, You are the Messiah. And then he warned them not to tell anyone. Finally, Peter gets it halfway through this gospel. He realizes who Jesus is. And the Christology of Mark is pinpointed on that, on the revelation of who Jesus is and reminding those people of Rome how Jesus was revealed to them. What you're going to find is that the gospel is split almost into two halves. Um, next week, Father TJ is going to come and he's going to speak to you about that first half of the gospel, um, Mark 1 through 9, as we begin to study that this fall. And in that period of time, it seems as if the identity of who Jesus really is is shrouded in mystery. You're going to see Jesus healing people. You're going to see Jesus exercising them of demons. And whenever he does this, most of the time, he says to them just what he said to Peter, don't tell anyone. 
don't tell anyone, just like he warned Peter. We call that the messianic secret, that he's keeping secret who he is. Well, in the second half of the gospel, we see Jesus being revealed, who he is. He is the Messiah, the Son of God. And just keep in mind, this is a reminder to that Roman church that he did defeat death and suffering, and that is who he is. Wilfred Harrington is a commentator that wrote um, on the Gospel of Mark. And this is what he said about the Christology that we find there. And I found it very moving, so I wanted to share it with you too. He is Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. But he is also the suffering Son of Man who walked a lone path to his death who died, as it seemed to him, abandoned even by God. Jesus was one who was glorified because he accepted the kenosis, or the self-emptying of himself, of his life and his death. It was not until he hung lifeless from the tree that he was acknowledged by men as the Son of God. The originality of Jesus flows from the contrast between his heavenly authority and power and the humiliation of his crucifixion. Mark's messianic secret is designed to reconcile two theological affirmations. Jesus from the first was indeed Messiah and yet had to receive from the Father through the abasement of the cross his title of Messiah. Therefore, Mark's way of discipleship is that of Romans 8.17. We are fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The way of discipleship has been firmly traced by Jesus himself. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The Christian must walk the same road that Jesus walked. The disciples in Mark are painted in their fragile humanness. Through them, Mark stresses the vital importance of coming to know Jesus. This concern accounts for the unbelievable obtuseness of Peter and the rest. All of us should have the honesty to see ourselves in those disciples. They had been called by Jesus and they had responded to his invitation. And Jesus bore with them in loving patience. So the snapshot of Mark is one of humanness. It's one of reality, of suffering, and even of death. A reminder to those disciples that were living in Rome at the time that it was coming to the cross that brought them to the resurrection of Jesus. And how we too now can see ourselves. Thank goodness that this gospel paints the human side of those disciples. As we watch them stumble and fall again and again and again, we can be thankful that Jesus was patient with them and that he's patient with us. The gospel comes to its climax at the very end when the revelation of who Jesus is is actually revealed not by one of these disciples but instead by a Gentile, by a centurion, a Roman centurion. These words are at the very end. Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. The veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing him saw how he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. May the Holy Spirit be with us this year as we go forward and we study this beautiful gospel as we see how Jesus revealed himself, as we allow him to reveal himself to us as well. Thank you.